Hi, I'm Mara Roby, Conservation Technician at Eastern Connecticut Conservation District. I'd like to wish you a very warm welcome to the Little River Healthy Watershed Collaborative and Source Water Protection Project kickoff. Thank you all for being here. So the, those of you who don't know us, um, Eastern Connecticut Conservation District, um, we are a nonprofit natural resource conservation organization. Um, we serve 36 towns in Eastern Connecticut. Um, some, here are some of the primary activities that we work on, um, but for the takeaway, um, basically we focus in our district a lot on um, water quality and um, really reaching out to our towns and citizens to provide whatever support we can, um, often in the form of um, workshops and trainings and teaching about um, non-point source pollution and ways that you can um, help with water quality. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And I just wanna mention before we get started too, um, that if you can hold any questions um, when Gina and I speak until the end, <clears throat> excuse me, that would be more helpful. Um, and that will help us maybe to be able to get through all of our agenda items in the time uh, that we allotted, which I kind of have a feeling we may go a little bit over. So I hope folks can, can stay if we do that. Um, so again, we're, just going to keep our um, video and audios off um, until it's uh, time for questions. And <clears throat> we are going to try to stick to our agenda as much as possible. Um, at this point, I just wanted to give a little history of the work that's already been done in the Little River watershed. Um, I call this group the Little River Healthy Watershed Collaborative. Um, I did that because I was looking for a specific grant and we'll discuss whether that name is appropriate or if we wanna change it. But I'm Jean Pillow, again, I work for the district and uh, that's a beautiful aerial shot of the Little River in South Woodstock taken by my friend and neighbor, um, Leslie Sweetnam, which uh, that's the Wyndham Lantris property. So what is the Little River Healthy Watershed Collaborative, which originally was the Little River Source Water Protection Team? Um, whether, you know, depending on what the name is or the leadership, it's just a group of government agencies, nonprofit organizations and individuals that all have a common focus on um, clean water in the Little River watershed from Woodstock and Putnam, this is a watershed. Um, extends into other towns as well, that we meet periodically and we update each other on different projects we're involved in that overlap um, and we collaborate with each other. And if you don't know what the word source water is, that's an industry buzzword. Um, source water refers to water that is a source of somebody's drinking water. So Little River is a source of drinking water, one of the sources of drinking water for our neighbor downstream in Putnam. And, um, you know, well, uh, source water could also be well water as well, it will private well or community wells. Uh, what is the current status of water quality in the Little River? Well, the green outline you see on this map is all the land that drains into the Little River, um, going up into Massachusetts, into Thompson, part of Pomfret, and into, Wood, uh, into Putnam. And, uh, it all drains into the Quinnebog River. And there are some water quality issues that we are aware of. Um, Muddy Brook is not meeting standards. Peckham Brook isn't meeting standards. Roseland Lake has got its own problems with cyanobacteria blooms um, supported by nutrient enrichment. Um, and we also know that Peak Brook has had elevated levels of E. coli, but not enough data to actually qualify it as not meeting standards. So you see that there is a lot of different areas in town where in Woodstock where there are water quality issues. You see there are also water quality issues downstream in Putnam as well. 
we have this timeline of um, different planning activities or designations that focus on Little River water quality. Um, back in 2006, the Atlantic Rural States and Water Wastewater Association, working with the Town of Putnam Water Pollution Control Authority, produced a document called the Little River Source Water Protection Plan. And it was an advisory document about potential conflicts with good water quality and just gave some advice on what needed to be um, focused on in terms of keeping uh, the water quality um, as good as it could be. Uh, that document was a start to a lot of um, partnering in the watershed. I'm sure there was a lot of partnering before that time, but I didn't come on board until just before then. So I don't, I can't recall that history. 2009, um, the Eastern Connecticut Conservation District put together the Little River, or the Muddy Brook Little River Water Quality Improvement Plan, which was our first formal EPA outline nine element watershed based plan to focus a, a lot more on issues in the Little River watershed. And the significance of this plan is that it opened opportunities for. Um, the town or different organizations to apply for funding from federal sources, um, you know, specifically the EPA non-point source um, grant program to um, work on addressing these water quality issues. In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service in um, collaboration with the US EPA and Connecticut DEP designated the Little River uh, watershed as a National Water Quality Initiative watershed. And that designation um, was important because a lot of the farms in Woodstock are using farm bill funds to do projects, big conservation projects on their farm that they couldn't afford out of pocket by themselves. That gave them the ability to apply for funding from a specified pool and not compete at the state level. 2018, the district followed up the Little River Muddy Brook plan by doing a, a, a focus on Roseland Lake um, because the nutrients in Roseland Lake are not necessarily coming all from the outside watershed, but from the lake itself. And we made some recommendations for that. But at the same time, um, NRCS nationally revised their National Water Quality Initiative requirements and the Little River plan didn't meet those criteria. So Based on that, um, they delisted it as a um, NACWI watershed. And we know how important that is. So ECCD um, negotiated with NRCS to get funds to update the little Muddy Brook Little River Plan to hopefully get that designation restored. So this next section I'm going to refer to as Little River but Big Projects. And I want you to understand that these are not just free money coming into working with our ag businesses. There's other projects we've done as well. But um, the farmers in the Little River watershed are very active stewards of their land and they invest a large amount of their own money to do these projects and they get supplemental funds to help them do some of these great things. Like when you talk about healthy soils, you need new equipment that um, is very expensive. So there's been a lot of assistance to help them all throughout the watershed. So I want to refer to this um, simple thing as like synergy and overlap. Um, because of that NACWI designation, we were able to get bigger projects completed in the watershed. So NRCS, which does cost sharing for conservation projects with farmers, um, were also matched with other projects, um, with EPA funded projects through the Connecticut DEP with ECCD as project manager. So for example, um, a farm in Woodstock uh, rebuilt their manure storage, which is what you see up in that, that thing that looks like a tennis court. I don't recommend you go there. Um, and next to it, you see these white things that look like an equal sign. And that's where they store their silage on this particular farm. And before um, ECCD worked with them, the silage was um, decomposing and um, producing a leachate that was leaking out from the silage pile and getting into a local brook and that caused the brook, everything in the brook to die except for fungus. So 
while the NRCS was supporting the construction of the manure storage facility, ECCD was working with the farm to reline those silage bunkers and to put in a um, manure capture system. I mean, the a leachate capture system. That leachate was now going instead of the brook into the manure storage facility, diluting it and reducing its environmental impact. This was a really big deal in our world because it led to the delisting of North Running Brook as impaired for aquatic life and that we celebrate these things. Uh, another example of Project Synergy was a farm in East Woodstock that um, needed to um, rebuild their manure storage so they put in a storage tank but the storage tank, you know, you want to size it appropriately so you can store at least six months worth of manure so you're not spreading in the winter when it's just going to sit on the surface. Um, there, this particular farm had their animals in open structures. They were able to get out onto the, um, the homestead, the, the barnyard in between. There was a lot of manure contamination. And every time it rained, the rainwater would wash that through. And they had to capture that those nutrients, so the nutrient capture system was being diluted with this roof runoff. So while the NRCS put in the tank, the EPA funds through Connecticut DEP and ECCD were able to put the um, gutters on the barn. And now that rainwater goes into a ditch that is going down to the local brook, but it's not carrying nutrients. It's not carrying um, E. coli bacteria with it. And here's another one that maybe is a little bit familiar to people in town, um, the big blue tanks in South Woodstock that was um, supported with some funding from the NRCS. But at the same time, those big tanks were going in, there were a lot of other projects that were going in that were funded with EPA money through CTDQP and ECCD, where a um, dry liquid separator system was installed on the farm and there's like a big squeeze though you squeeze out all the liquid the liquid would go to the tanks the solids would be collected and they can use it for animal bedding to get that liquid from the barn to the tanks a pump house had to be built and plumbing installed to pump that liquid now to the tanks and the, the, that barn all that farm also needed to have their silage system um, relined and capture of the leachate, which all now goes to the tanks and not into the environment. So these are really big projects that are, were able to be completed because of the Little River being a national water quality initiative and, and funding they were getting from outside sources to help supplement what it cost. Um, also, like I said, when you um, switch over to healthy soil practices, no-till farming, you need new equipment. And NRCS programs do not pay for equipment, but we were able to help farms acquire new equipment, including precision planting equipment and manure injectors, which um, will reduce the amount of runoff from these farms um, and uh, impacting local streams. And we also know a lot more about water quality in the Little River watershed thanks to volunteers and support from the last Green Valley Water Quality Monitoring Program because the volunteers and some of them are on this uh, uh, meeting um, really helped us collect quality data and we know a lot more um, than we knew before um, we wrote the plan in 2009. So how does the collaborative work? Well, we have groups get together like today. We share concerns and updates on projects impacting water quality. And then we talk about things, we collaborate, we share ideas or plan new projects. And I uh, want you to know it's open enrollment. So if you want to get involved, you can contact me at my email address, or I will um, later on during Morris presentation in the chat, I will put the link to our MailChimp account that I created specifically for this group so that we can create a um, email list for people who wanna become involved or be kept up to date. I promise you, we will not bombard you with emails. Usually this will just be for meeting notes and meeting agendas or any specific things that we wanna announce. We also um, set up a Facebook page specific to this project. So I can do more immediate updates on little things 
that aren't newsworthy for an email. So anybody who wants to join that, again, look in the chat for the link, or when we produce the meeting notes for this meeting, I will make sure those links are available to you there. And I am going to stop sharing because that's my last slide. And Maura, it is your turn to take over. Okay. I'm gonna share my screen now. Can you all see that? I can. Jean, you can let me know. I see it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that's important. Okay, so um, again, uh, I'm going to be talking about the, um, this uh, new project that we're doing, the Source Water Protection Project. Um, again, protecting uh, drinking water watershed. And <clears throat> this is the map again that Jean had already showed um, with a little more detail of the roads so you can kind of maybe pick out where you are in the watershed. Um, this is actually contains some of the um, sub-regional watersheds as well. That's why there's some lines in between. Um, and so it's like uh, English Neighborhood Brook and Millbrook and um, Little River Watershed all combined. Um, so if you just look at the most outer outline, that would be the whole watershed. As you can see, it's in uh, mostly in Woodstock, but some in Pomfret, a little bit in Putnam, and we have some in Thompson, as well as some in Southbridge, Mass. <clears throat> so um, to pick up a little bit more from Jean's timeline, um, in 2009, there was the Muddy Brook Little River uh, Water Quality Improvement Plan that then received the 2013 uh, National Water Quality Initiative designation to address impaired water bodies. And I'm going to call that NACWI from now on because that's such a mouthful to say. I probably will mess it up if I try to. So um, we are going to update in this new project this, uh, the 2009 plan. Um, and it has a number of sources of um, where the pollutants are coming from listed in that plan, but for the update, we're going to just focus on agriculture um, since this is a NACWI plan. So not picking on ag. Sorry about that. And Again, in 2018, NRCS um, updated the requirements for the NACWI. Um, so that's why we're doing this because it was then removed um, from that um, designation. So we are trying to get that back by doing this update. Um, we wanna restore that dedicated funding so farmers don't have to compete um, with the whole state. Um, they would be funding just for the Little River watershed. Keep hitting the wrong button, sorry. <laughs> um, as far as the plan updates, um, this plan is, sorry, I'm trying to see my bottom of my slide. My, my toolbar was in the way. The plan update is being funded by NRCS through Connecticut Source Water Protection Grant. Um, to the Connecticut Council on Soil and Water Conservation. And then there's some additional funding as well um, provided by NRCS through a couple of regional conservation partnership programs. So um, the cost benefit analysis is um, one of the important updates that we will be doing. Um, and this is gonna look at calculating targeted reductions in phosphorus, nitrogen, and ammonia. And we'll do that in relationship to um, NRCS practices. Now, when I say practices, that is an NRCS term. Um, and so that's a technical um, state and local standards um, are practices um, that include designs and installations and um, operation and maintenance. Um, and these practices address uh, conservation natural resource concerns. Um, you could also consider them like improvements. Um, and then there's financial resources and planning help that go into that. So um, 
as far as um, the practices, we're, we want to look at um, which ones are more efficient or which conservation system of practices, so a whole set of practices, is going to be more efficient at reducing those nutrients that I just talked about. Um, so we are planning on, or we are currently looking at existing practices, and then we are going to look at planned NRCS practices, and that will all go into um, looking at what the co water quality goals um, can be. And also we will be doing farm inventories. Um, we would like to get out on the ground. We can do a little bit um, with GIS mapping, but we want to be able to get our boots on the ground to see if, if some of these um, potential concerns um, do exist. And we would like you know, to talk with farmers and, and talk about um, their ability to adopt these practices and, and what might be hindering um, them for doing that. Um, we also are gonna come up with an action plan so we can identify strategies uh, to work with farmers um, to meet water quality goals. And <clears throat> we are engaging with farmers. And so people here, um, other farmers in the watershed, all of you stakeholders um, in the Little River watershed, as we update the plan, um, that's very important for us to feel like, we want you to feel like this is your plan too. You know, you have input and we are really gonna listen and, and take in what you have to say and incorporate that. So please feel like this is your plan too. Um, just to dive in a little bit deeper into the project details, um, the NACWI partnership includes USDA and RCS, Connecticut DEEP or Department of uh, Energy and Environmental Protection, Connecticut Department of Public Health, and US EPA, as well as ECCD. Um, so this is going to provide targeted um, type of funding called EQIP from NRCS for financial and technical assistance in small watersheds. <clears throat> and sorry, I have to keep moving my bar around. <laughs> um, Contributing additional resources are Connecticut Deep, Connecticut Department of Public Health, ECCD, and others. Um, for instance, providing resources for monitoring efforts that help track water quality improvements over time. And so um, all of these things um, contribute and support um, the voluntary NRCS uh, conservation practices. And these promotes, promote soil health, reduce erosion, and um, put less nutrients and pathogens uh, in the runoff. So I don't have a complete list here, but um, we will need to be doing some field assessments on specific farms to see what kind of practices um, can be implemented. But some examples um, would be filter strips or grassed waterways. Um, these can uh, slow velocity runoff, allow settling of suspended particles, um, have infiltration, retainment, and uptake of pollutants on and by the plants and the soil. There's also cover crops, which many of you are already doing, uh, seasonal vegetative plantings to protect the soil from erosion and improve the soil with um, very good root structures and really support um, the biology, like the microbes um, and all of the um, fungi, you know, that are really important for the structure of the soil to keep it all um, together and also organic matter. We also have um, some folks doing reduced or no-till. Um, so keeping that soil in as natural state as possible um, with all of those root systems and myco mycorrhizal fungi and all the, that good stuff that keeps it all uh, together. Um, we wanna keep that um, in its natural state as much as possible and then the soil can do what it does best. Um, there's also manure management. And so this would be a system to capture, store, treat, and use um, the manure on site and or, or have a way to transport it off site. And that will help prevent pollutants from getting into the nearby surface and groundwaters. 
So as you can see, um, you know, these will all contribute to dual purpose goals and, um, you know, benefiting, of course, natural resources and water quality, but really um, increasing and being able to be sustainable in the agriculture um, is very important too. I think that um, we're all here because we feel really connected to the land and the water around us. Um, and I think whether you're a farmer or a gardener planting crops, whether you're someone um, participating in recreation, such as swimming and paddling and fishing and hunting and all the great things that, that we can do in this area, even vacationing, um, folks want to go to the mountains, they want to go to lakes and streams and beaches. Um, you know, we all, I think, can come together as a community and support, um, you know, taking care of nature the way that it, it works for us and, and finding ways to learn more about it and how we can be sustainable on the land. Um, so hopefully we can um, all agree on that. Okay. So thinking about um, that working together um, as community, we, ECCD, we are looking to um, ask of you folks and other farmers, other stakeholders in the Little River watershed um, to um, Jean and I and possibly Dan will be going out on site visits over the next six months to identify some of those potential natural resource concerns, of course, with your um, Okay, and um, we'd like to identify some of those, again, voluntary um, and RCS practices that can help you address them. And, um, you know, some of the things that we might find could be, for example, um, there are lots of, um, there can be lots of ditches on the edges of fields, and those would be transporting runoff, um, again, and nutrients into local waterways. So something like adding filter strips could help address that. Or there may be infield or out of field erosion. So you could address that with cover crops or reduced till um, or any kind of manure storage issues. You know, we can help, help with that, um, have NRCS practices that can help with that. So um, again, I, you know, we want to keep stressing this is voluntary and it's very exciting because in the new 2018 Farm Bill, um, there are now certain practices that can have up to a 90% cost share. And um, they've also removed the requirement that you have a certain amount of income from your um, farm or business. So um, it can include now hobby farms and that could be farms like with horses or whatever types of animals that, that you think um, may need assistance with. So that's really good news. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We are also looking for your input again on how to engage farmers um, in learning about our NRC, these NRCS programs. Um, I think there are a certain number of farmers in the watershed who definitely know all about these programs and um, rightly so take full advantage. And we want to make sure that the smaller farms and all the farms know about um, some of these things that can help and uh, protect um, the watershed. So we are also um, seeking input on um, how to communicate um, to others and come up with like an outreach plan to include um, more stakeholders, um, other folks in the community, um, town officials, you know, we want to really get everybody involved that we can. And so to stress also that um, any of the information that we collect on the farms um, will definitely only be in a summary form. Um, so for example, we might say, um, you know, this number of acres of cropland could have cover crops on them in the watershed in general. So we will have information on individual farms, but we certainly would never share that. And this will be a public document. So we would never share that. Um, so your privacy would, would definitely be respected. So I just wanted to um, 
talk a little bit about um, some results um, from the, the NACWI program. And since 2012, about 3,700 producers are applying conservation practices on nearly a million acres. Um, since that same time, 11 impaired water bodies saw successful water quality improvements. And I have to shout out to, uh, that includes North Running Brook in our own um, watershed. So that's great. And in 2016, about 30% of NACWI watersheds improved in at least one pollutant and about 80% of those were from agricultural conservation practices that were implemented. So um, I think that, um, you know, we're definitely making progress slowly but surely with the NACWI and we want to keep that going. And it's definitely important to us that um, all of you help inform and guide this project. So Hi, this was going to be, yeah. I've got the uh, poll question. Oh, good. Which one? You can do it any one you want. There's two, but put it up. Did it show up? I do not see it. Because attendees are now yes, doing I see questions it. and it's people are chiming in. I guess I don't see it because I'm screen sharing maybe. The poll question is gone, and there's really no way to answer the poll. Why don't you put the screen share down, I guess? No, anyway, I put it back up. Sorry. 19 of 22 people that's responded. I'm going to end the polling and share the results. So 95% of you believe all the above, and that is the correct answer. So anybody who answered any of the other things was correct as well. Right. I'm assuming that's the soil health question because unfortunately I didn't get to see it for whatever reason. Right. That was the soil health question. Here's polling question number two, okay? You could read it. Who is the only National Association of Conservation Districts, NACD, soil health champion in Connecticut? Multiple choice. Read the answers. The answers are Rocky Field, Paxton Hinckley, Lucas Young, Sandy Beach, or Dr. I am Glomulin. And we're getting close to being almost everybody um, responding. I don't see any more, so I'm going to end the polling now and share the results. 61% um, of you chose Lucas Young, and that is the correct answer. And to our benefit, Lucas Young is a farmer in the Little River watershed. And so, um, Maura, would you like to explain what a soil health champion is and why this is so significant? Sure. So um, the National Association of Conservation Districts, um, or NACD, they choose uh, a soil health champion um, in different, all different um, states in the United States. So they have uh, 250 farmers and ranchers that they choose. And these are folks that are practicing good uh, soil health systems and really promoting that in their community. So for Lucas to get um, this is, is really exciting and that he is the only one in the state, uh, and I believe the first one in the state. So we're, we're all very proud of that, of him. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the farmers panel. Um, and what we'll do is each farmer will have about 
five to seven or eight minutes um, to talk about um, how NRCS has helped them and give us a little bit of their story. I know it's not a lot of time, but see what you can fit in. And um, we wanted to have a few minutes um, for questions. So after they, they're done, um, you can either um, raise your hand um, or you can go to the chat um, if you're not able to find that. Um, Raising your hand, Jean, where was that again? What reactions. Button? In so, reactions. Sorry, I'd forgotten that. Um, move your so you can go. Cursor. You have to move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen. The toolbar will come up. You'll see a little smiley face. Click on that and then raise hand is an option. All right. So why don't we get started? Um, we're going to start with uh, Matt Peckin of Peck, uh, sorry, Matt, Matt Peckham of Helm Farm. I can't talk. And so I'll ask you to turn on your um, video and your audio. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Matt Peckham from Elm Farm. Hoping you can hear me. Yep. Um, so I am a sixth generation dairy farmer at our farm, Elm Farm, and we own Farm to Table Market in East Woodstock. Um, I guess I'm one of those people who feels like uh, conservation is not solely solely left to dairy farmers in this town, but boy, we play a, a great big part of it. Um, you know, we're kind of what feels like at the, the headwaters of R Little River Watershed. And I think other dairy farmers like Paul Miller and John Hermanot, you know, would agree with me that we spend an awful lot of time thinking about our conservation practices and what we can do to have better water quality for the Little River. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about it. It's what got me involved in the whole um, world of conservation years and years ago. I did a project with our former e, uh, CCD uh, um, head and we started doing some projects where we were just covering up manure piles with hay for a project for Yukon to see if manure that was stacked in a cornfield that had hay on it would have less runoff during the winter than manure that was just stacked in a field. And I said, well, that's silly. But as we got deeper into the project, I learned that, you know, there was a lot that I could do as a dairy farmer for conservation. And that project led to other projects. It led to the um, slide you saw where we put the gutters on the roofs of our barns to keep clean water out of our manure storage and make less manure that had to get spread on the fields. It led to work with NRCS where we built a 1.4 million gallon manure storage system here at the farm, which for us, you know, we, we only milk 100 or 120 cows at the time, kind of felt like a small farm doing a massive project. And, you know, that project has just become part of our daily life. It, it, it doesn't seem so massive anymore. You know, working with uh, ECCD and NRCS has become part of our operation. Doing what we can do for conservation is, is huge. It's huge on our farm. Uh, we've moved from manure management and making sure that we had all of our leachate collected so all of our leachate from our silage pits got tied into the manure management system. Uh, there's no more, uh, like there's no more runoff from our farm headquarters here where we milk the cows on Doug Hill Road going into um, our little tributary brook that feeds Peckham Brook. So from there, we had another, uh, another project come up where we were thinking about how to handle mortalities on the farm. Uh, quite a few farms at the time were building uh, compost sheds to deal with mortalities. And I said, well, gosh, that, you know, there's some other 
ideas out there on how to make compost. So the district was good enough to help us out with an aerated compost facility that we can start our, our, our any mortalities that we have on the farm. We can start composting them. And instead of having to go in with a tractor and, and take the time to turn over that compost and keep it going, we actually have plenums in the floor of our building that, that move air up through the bottom of our compost piles and um, keep the compost cooking. So all you've got to really do, other than drain the leachate that comes into the plenums, is, is take a, a look at your temperatures every few days when you have a, you know, you have a, a mortality and you're creating the compost and then make some adjustments to your airflow, whether you need more air to get the microbes going and cooking or you need less air because you to get them started. It's just a simple system. I, I my goal for conservation is to try to figure systems that work for the specific farms because nothing in this world is one size fits all. And I everyone who knows me would say I kind of preach that. I, I push it on our NRCS field techs that, you know, we need to we need to fit projects to farms so that way the, the farmers are comfortable with what they're doing. Like I like having the opportunity to sp spread liquid manure in the springtime to grow my corn, but not everybody wants to have all of that infrastructure for liquid manure. For some people, you know, composting all their manure and being able to sell it off the farm uh, to uh, generate some more revenue, that works for them. So that's kind of my whole, you know, sort of take on, on environmentalism is that we need to be sure that what we're doing is what works for the specific farmer. Next year we are taking on a, or this year, very soon, we're taking on a very, very big project where we're going to um, change around our secondary farm uh, where the farm table market is. And this is a, a huge project. We're going to be moving cows and manure storage to undercover. And we're going to be um, moving all of our, our silage from there to our home farm here. So it, there's, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot of people who are willing to help us out. And I think that we're, um, the best thing we can do as, as farmers in this watershed is take all the help we can get and try to keep Roseland and, and keep the little rivers as, cl as clean as we can. So I will turn it back to Mora and let her go on to the next farmer who wants to talk. But I'd be glad to take any questions later. Okay. <clears throat> I guess I was thinking that um, if anyone wanted to ask any questions now, it might be a good time. Um, just to, uh, if it's fresh in their mind, but I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, and I also don't, I don't actually know if anyone is raising their hand. I guess I need to look here. Okay, uh, Kira Jacobs. Okay, I'm hey, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi. I have spent over 20 years doing this work in source water protection, and I don't think I've ever heard a producer say it as eloquently as you just did. So I was wondering, how do we, those of us who spend our, our time, full time protecting drinking water supplies and trying to partner with agriculture, farmers and landowners, how do you recommend that we reach out to you and educate? How do we do a better job helping people become aware that their farms are located in drinking water protection areas? Because we're having this conversation in every state in New England about the NWQI, the National Water Quality Initiative, whether it's hobby farmers or, or um, dairy farmers like yourself. And I also was on at the beginning of this um, call, so I got to hear you talk about your children and, and the, the Cabot um, no salt butter label. So I really enjoy um, just hearing you talk about um, your life as a producer. Oh, thanks. I, um, you know, it, I think 
a lot of us are just very interested. There's, there's not, I hate to say it, there's not a ton of dairy farmers left. And those of us who are farming, you know, the practices that, that we're doing now are, are our best, you know, the most efficient, best practices. And um, the, the, the best way to sort of show those off or to let people know at this point is through, is through um, social media. You know, that is connecting with people through social media is the way to go. I know in our town, our farms are doing an awesome job connecting and, and, and getting the word out, sharing, uh, sharing any videos or sharing any uh, pictures of farms that are that you follow on social media, doing a good job on say a town page, like we have Woodstock Proud page, you know, just getting the message. We're, we're all so busy that it, it's hard. It's not like we get together and, and visit with people. You know, this is a very, very, very full-time job for us. We don't make the time to get out off the farm like we used to, just because of everything it takes to keep these farms going and, and generate income so we can continue to farm. It's just uh, a time killer. So meeting people online, sharing our story online seems to be the, the best way right now to, to, to let people know what we're all about, what we're doing, and that, yeah, I mean, we are on the front line of being environmentalists. We, my favorite quote is, we're not environmental activists, we're active environmentalists. And that's, you know, for most of us, I think that's the way we, we, we live our lives in, in farming. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, I have to agree. I, I love hearing you talk about the farm and all, all of these um, things are important to you. Um, so I feel hopeful that we're, we're doing something with this social media today that's maybe helpful. <laughs> all right. I think we're going to move on to the next farmer and make sure we have enough time to get everybody in. So um, Eric Young is here from Woodstock Orchards. So you can go ahead, Eric. Hey, yeah, hi, I'm, uh, I'm wood, er, with Woodstock Orchards. Um, we've been uh, farming fruits and vegetables here for, for quite some time now. We're the third, um, fourth, if you want to go back really far, farm that's been located on Woodstock Hill producing apples. Um, we do a lot of apples, we do a lot of vegetables, and we've started to do a lot of um, high tunnel growing as well. Uh, we used a equip grant a couple, I say a couple, it's probably five or six years ago now to move our vegetable production um, to no-till. And we started dabbling in it a little bit with squash and pumpkins. And there were some growing pains, but um, it's actually been very responsive and, and very beneficial in ways we never thought it would be. Um, it, was, it was frustrating for the older generation to kind of go through the going, growing pains of, of seeing the different methods, not pulling a moldboard plow through the ground first. Um, but it, it works very well. We end up going through uh, in the spring and rolling down our cover crop that is uh, traditionally rye mixed with a couple other mix mixed species. Uh, we roll that down and we're actually planting directly into that. And if we achieve a good uh, bed of rye, we typically do not need to come through with any herbicide to kill any of that, which is fantastic for us being a apple orchard located on top of a hill, there is always uh, erosion, always runoff. Um, we've kind of had our hands tied with our location on how to deal with it. Um, so we come through, we plant into that, that bed and the plants uh, get a nice good head start while the rye dies. And by the time the cucurbits have grown big enough, they can pretty much drown out any incoming weeds from sunlight. 
uh, which was awesome on ground that was previously orchard. Uh, it did not work so well on ground that was previously vegetable. There was a, a heavy seed bank that we had to fight off for three, four years. Um, but since then has really started to dwindle and we're starting to take control of it again. Um, as far as uh, the, the fruit side goes, we, uh, we've been trying to eliminate erosion specifically under the trees. Uh, common practice for apple growers is to have a kill strip under the tree, which eats up a lot of herbicide, a lot of heavy herbicides that uh, have to kill things such as bittersweet and morning glory that are all over the place around here. Um, not many growers have have really moved away from the kill strip and we've kind of been researching recently uh putting a strip of grass under and uh moving to a mower that would actually hydraulically sense the tree coming and move a swing arm and be able to mow everything down rather than chemically kill everything uh eliminating the kill strip which in some of our plantings could be up to six feet wide or down to 32 inches wide, um, greatly reducing all of our erosion and just our uh, degrading of the soil with the herbicide, hitting it year after year after year. Um, we also, the other equip grant we moved through was the high tunnel. Um, for, for crops that don't respond well with our no-till transplanter, such as tomatoes, we've gone inside of a hoop house and grow direct in the soil, eliminating all rainwater erosion. And this has been amazing. Um, the plants don't get any of the morning dew. They don't get introduced to the diseases that come through some of these Southern, uh, storms and the quality of a uh, tomato or we've done peppers, the, just the quality that comes out of those, those hoop houses is amazing and I'll put them up against anything. Um, it, it's just been, been a lot of work trying to research this. Uh, I, I went to SUNY Cobaskill and kind of got the little bug for soil health there um, came back to the farm, kind of fell back into the rut of doing it the way we always do it until uh, one of my, uh, I guess, mentors, I would say, Ray Cavino, started bugging us at the farm. And he was amazing with his enthusiasm and his knowledge. And that really kicked off the farm. And I would say it kicked off a lot of farms in our area. Um, and now it's just been running ever since. And I, I just got to thank a lot of the, the USDA and uh, a lot of these departments around us for actually coming out and visiting the farmer. Um, it means a lot to a farmer when someone shows up at six o'clock in the morning for a meeting, uh, kind of makes you, you respect them a little bit more as badly as that says, but uh, it, it just, it really shows an appreciation for what you're doing, uh, which I think in turn makes us appreciate what they have to say more. Um, that's really all I have right now. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, that is so great to hear. Um, I really love hearing your story and um, how you came about to soil health and um, you know, I don't know if I can get up that early, but I'll try to be on a farm at six if that's what you guys need. Gene, too. <laughs> um, so that was, that's really great to hear. I don't see any um, questions unless somebody wants to just unmute. But um, so far, I think we'll just move on and you could always ask it after. Um, so we're going to, um, I'm probably going to not pronounce their names correctly, but I will try Yoko Takamura and Alex Carpenter at Asawaga Farm. I hope uh, I pronounced that. Oh, it's Asawaga Farm. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, okay, good. I'm Alan Carpenter. I'm Yoko. And we own and operate Osawaga Farm. We're located in East Putnam. So we're adjacent to the Little River watershed, um, but the health of it, of course, impacts everybody around. Um, so we were asked to talk today because of our soil practices and because of our relationship with NRCS. Uh, a little bit about us, we are nestled between the Osawaga River, which you might know as the Five Mile River and the Mary Brown Brook. Uh, we are a no-till farm. Uh, we are certified organic, small scale. We do everything by hand, no tractor. Um, about three quarters of an acre in annual growing space, and we're adding some pollinator habitats, hedgerows, and perennial beds this year, so we can call it an acre. Uh, we're really committed to soil health. First and foremost, we are soil farmers, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, we're also committed to the health of the waterways around. Um, we own 23 acres. We farm on an acre of it. Most of our land is wetlands. Uh, and a lot of our allies in the field are the beneficial insects, the amphibians, the snakes, who um, the health of them is directly proportional to the health of the waterways and the ecosystem. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, our farm and our relationship with NRCS. Yeah, so I, we wanted to talk about the sort of four guiding principles that we follow here on the farm. Um, so that's maximizing photosynthesis, um, increasing biodiversity, both underground and above ground, um, keeping the ground covered at all times, and also no-till, which we'll, Alex will cover at the end. So maximizing photosynthesis sounds, you know, really obvious. We're farmers, we grow crops and forage, um, but it's, it might be surprising to you that about, so the plants on average, on an average farm, be it conventional or organic, um, the plants are photosynthesizing at about 15 to 20 percent of their their maximum capacity to be able to photosynthesize. So, so that means that it could be an unbalance in macronutrients. It could be that they're not accessing um, like a particular trace mineral. It could be that there's not enough carbon dioxide at the ground level where the sto stomatas are. Um, so. In order to address that, we, we of course look at our abiotic environment, make sure that there's enough sunlight, plenty water for the plants, but also underground, making sure that there's an abundant community of microbes. And for that, we do use a lot of inoculants. So we inoculate um, bacteria and fungal inoculants. And that, of course, with all that respiration happening with the microbes underground, that releases a lot of car carbon dioxide, which helps, you know, feed that to the plants. And um, yeah, our one of our goals is to really minimize and almost completely do away with NPK inputs, um, really any inputs at all, and try to get our microbes to have, um, to supply all the, the nutrients that the plants need. Um, yeah, I think that's all. For me. Yeah, so the second uh, principle is increasing biodiversity. Um, biodiversity is super important for so many different reasons. We don't have time to get into everything. We could talk for hours about this stuff. Um, but like Yoko said, increasing biodiversity, not only above ground, but below ground. Um, there's a complex economy going on in the soil with fungal life and bacteria and plant roots, macro and microorganisms. And if there's a breakdown in one section of that, it affects the entire system, uh, both below ground and above ground. Um, plants aren't able to access the nutrients they need if they don't have all of those things working in tandem. Um, insects start to take over and attack crops that aren't healthy because they're not getting the things. It's just kind of this uh, downward spiral that you fall into if you're ignoring the health of the soil and the system around it. Um, again, I can talk endlessly about that, but we want to tie it into NRCS. So we have applied for a program to build a pollinator habitat and hedgerows here. Um, that's obviously going to put perennial roots in the soil. Most of what we grow is uh, annual. Perennial roots are great because they establish safe zones for mycorrhizal fungi, uh, bacteria populations, and it also brings in above ground beneficial insects, pollinators, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said about it, but we're excited to pursue that with NRCS. So the third point is keeping our ground covered. So of course we try to prioritize covering with green plants, living plants, so that it's, you know, the root exudates of those plants are feeding the microbes. Um, so we do all sorts of cover crops 
almost all of our 100, 100 foot beds are in cover crops at um, once, I, feel, I think, yeah. um, a, at least once during the season. And every year we try to add some something new, a new cover crop and try to diversify that mix. Um, so, and then, oh yes, yeah, so with that NRCS, hopefully we can maybe get funding for some some kind of cover crop uh, work in the future. Of course, cover crops at, at our scale, it's so much work because it's almost like we're preparing for a vegetable, right? We have to prepare the bed, sow it, we gotta terminate, you know, which is in a no-till fashion, which means it's a little bit more work. So it's, it's we treat it as a cash crop and we value it as the same as a cash crop. So it's money in the bank. Yeah. So um, it's a lot of work, but it, yeah, I don't know how that would, you know, that would get funded, but um, something to think about. And yeah, if we can't cover it with cover crops, then we would go ahead and uh, mulch with hay. And yeah, just making sure that erosion isn't happening and that, you know, a bare, bare soil means that we're effectively killing microbes in the soil. So we do try to really avoid that at all costs. So. Yep. And just to quickly tie back in the cover crops to increasing biodiversity, when we talk about cover crops too, we're not talking about like a monocrop cover crop. We're not talking about just planting winter rye or just planting oats or peas. Um, we have been building up the uh, number, the diversity of those cover crops. We plant maybe three or four different things in a bed now. Uh, in the future, we're hoping to get up to maybe a dozen plus different cover crops, uh, all serving different purposes, all feeding different uh, microbiotic communities. Um, it's very, very complex. Oh, and, oh, and I also wanted to <laughs> add that, so yeah, in the past we've been doing cover crops as, you know, separate to cash crops, but this season we want to experiment with putting cover crops together while the ca cash crops are growing next to it. So we're going to experiment with that a lot this year, especially legumes. So the final principle, I feel like this is a sprint. Um, again, we can talk about this for ages. And we do have, if you go to YouTube, we did a CT NOFA virtual farm tour last year. That's all there. It's like two hours with question and answers. Shows the farm and our practices more in depth. And we're happy to talk about it. Um, but no-till, there's so much we can say about it. Um, the benefits of no-till are just getting to be more and more well-known. Just as the uh, non-benefits of tillage are becoming more and more well-known, they're inversely related. Um, soil quality, uh, microbe count, uh, the nutritional density of plants, everything goes up, gets better when you're not tilling the soil. Uh, the most disturbance that we do is to use a broad fork to aerate the soil. Uh, it sounds like a ton of work. I know a lot of people who are transitioning over or thinking about going into no-till or kind of find it daunting, uh, but what we find is the initial input is a lot of labor and then it just gets easier as the time goes on because you're establishing a system that is healthy, that is taking care of itself. Last year, we didn't cover any of our beds during the summer to protect against insects because our plants are responding to the health of the soil and they're starting to, in conjunction with the environment and, and everything on our farm, they're starting to develop a, 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 like an immune system basically. Um, it, it's amazing to see and, and we're happy not to use so much plastic on our farm and, and all that. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're already over time, but um, one thing to tie that in. So the biggest project that we did with NRCS was putting in an underground irrigation pipeline last spring. Um, and to tie that into no-till, when you're doing no-till, the organic matter, um, the water retention of your soil, like we have very fine sandy loam, but we're closing in on 10% organic matter because we're not beating the hell out of it all the time. And it's holding on to a lot of water, especially when we put mulch down or when we have cover crops in it. So last year was a historic drought and we used some water, but not as much as a lot of tillage farms would have used. And we don't have as much runoff going into the rivers around us, not that we use any chemicals or anything. Um, but I think that looking at that part of that NRCS program, I guess it was an AMA fund, was to uh, track the water that we were using too. And it was just a, a really interesting exercise. And we're gonna continue to do that and see how it goes over time. Hopefully this won't be another drought year. And uh, yeah, it'll, it'll just be great to track that. So we appreciate that aspect of that NRCS grant. Wow. Thank you guys. 
I mean, I could listen to you all day. <laughs> well, we and I hope other people feel that way because I, I think you guys are amazing. You're doing like such fascinating things and it gets me really excited again about all of the soil health um, workshops that I did like seems like a long time ago and now it's all coming back to me and the mycorrhizal fungi and it's it's so exciting i guess we're nerds but <laughs> um, well, i'm a nerd i should do a self-promotion thing but i did meant i forgot to mention in our introduction um so we do have a big farmer's market up in boston but last year with covid and everything we pulled out of a market up there and we started a farm stand here on the farm and we have a very vibrant community so we're right here in east putnam right on route 44 um, when the season starts up, we love to have people come out, walk around the farm, talk about soil practices. We're very open. We want to get people excited about, about soil health and uh, get everybody to be a soil biologist at some level. So come and come and see us. That's awesome. I definitely will be going there. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any questions at this point. Oh wait, unless I'm missing. No, I see that Jean was clapping. <laughs> do you have a question, Maura? What's that? Okay. I do have a question. Um, with the underground irrigation piping, I um, just watched a workshop on that, on farmer praising that and how it's reduced its water use. Do you also add your nutrients through that irrigation piping or if, if you're supplementing your nutrients on the farm? We did that a little bit. We're getting into fertigation. Um, last year, we're going to be doing it quite a bit this year. Uh, so we won't be feeding it through the pipes, but you know, coming out specialized, we put hydrants in to serve all of our different fields. And uh, we're gonna be doing that quite a bit this season. Uh, also, we have one greenhouse we'll be doing in there quite a bit. Excellent. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Anybody else like to ask a question? All right, thank you again. My gosh, I'm I'm just I'm so grateful to you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules and just really enlightening us all on um, what's happening out there. And I hope others are are getting as much out of this as, as I am. And I'm furiously trying to write everything down. Um, so maybe we have to have a, a longer workshop so that that folks can talk more, um, that would be great. What you can do is go to the Yukon Extension workshop series. Um, I We can send this PDF that has links. If you're interested in any of these, there's one actually tonight, uh, if you're not all Zoomed out by then, uh, to uh, dig into the whys and hows of no-till farming. There's one on Thursday, March 11th. Uh, pros and cons of different composting and then they're having a save the date for March 27th to learn about ecological growing um, to support reduced or no pesticide use um, some some of what um, Yoko uh, um, I'm sorry Yoko was talking about and um, build soil health to manage pests and environmental challenges so this is a um, through Yukon Extension and also uh, USDA, and it's the solid ground. Um, like I said, we can we can send that along by email. Okay, and now we're going to have agency update dates with Jean. At this point, Mark, can you stop sharing the screen so people can um, okay. we can go back to talking as a group. And it, uh, typically at our uh, coalition meetings, we have different people from different agencies share a little updates about, you know, healthy water uh, work, what we're doing in Little River or around the region. So I'm going to go through um, the agency people that as I see them on the screen, um, Kara, you come up first. Is there anything specific that you would like to share from EPA? Hi. So I feel like I've already taken a little bit of time, but I just want to say again that source water protection is is a, a long game. So we are all working together to try to improve water quality in this very important watershed. And I don't think Steve Wynette was able to come back to the, the meeting yet, my colleague from the 319 non-point source program. But as I 
mention in the chat, and if you could just include it in the minutes, we have a national source water collaborative that is comprised of 29 members, including NACD nationally representing the conservation districts, NRCS, and I didn't mention, um, but it also represents uh, the Clean Water Agency. So Connecticut Deep is represented nationally, as well as uh, Eric McPhee's organization or the Connecticut Department of Public Health is represented by the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators. So the, the purpose of the Source Water Collaborative and the work that we've been doing in Connecticut is um, goes back to, well, many decades, but but more formally since 2005 when we had our kickoff source water protection meeting and we have had this statewide Connecticut source water collaborative since um, I believe 2012. So we have a lot of resources. We have a lot of people that are committed to this, not only at the watershed scale, but statewide in the region because I work with all six New England states and nationally. So um, I'll just say that if any of you are also uh, forested landowners, we are doing a really great forestry learning exchange for um, drinking water protection. And we have a free webinar series that kicked off last week and I'll be moderating a session with um, uh, one of our water suppliers from Maine and um, an expert from uh, forestry in Texas. So it's a national webinar series that we're excited about because I know a lot of landowners, uh, producers in Connecticut also own um, a lot of, for have a lot of forested land on their property. So I'll put some of this in the chat, Jean, and I will also um, send you some follow-up information to include in the notes. So thank you very much and we're happy to answer any questions offline as well. And I am signed up for that forestry series. I was great. involved in one last week. So great program. Thank you for and, being part of that. Yeah, and Bill Purcell from Wyndham County Natural, uh, NRCS office. Hi, hey, Jean, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so NRCS, we, we constantly accept applications throughout the year. Currently, we have a few applications inside the watershed to approve some water quality through some manure management practices. So that's pretty promising that we have a, a couple of prospects in the, um, in the pipeline, so to speak. And um, like, I, like I said, we're always accepting applications. And um, there's, Alex and Yoko mentioned that they, um, they were involved with the Agricultural Management Assistance Program. But um, NRCS, we have a, a variety of different programs that we offer to farmers and landowners through the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the Agricultural Management Assistance Program, and there's another program, the Conservation Stewardship Program, and that's geared towards landowners who are farmers that have participated in EQIP, that they're doing good conservation practices, and the purpose of that program is to try to take them, to get them to go another notch up to improve their environmental stewardship on the lands. Um, we're anticipating having some applications um, an uh, application round open this year, and I'm hoping to do an outreach event on that. So um, I might be, you know, reaching out to some farmers that I think would be good prospects for that. Um, that's about it for me. Thank you, Bill. All right, everybody's moved around, so I'm looking to see who comes up next. Dan, what's happening? <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's great to hear from uh, all the producers in the watershed, and it's very exciting to uh, know that the tide is really changing on these soil health practices. And I just want to say that the uh, Conservation District has the staff on board, and we're ready to go out and assist producers in the Little River watershed and beyond um, to do our assessments and assist with getting some funding through NRCS. So, uh, feel free to contact any of us at any time and we will come out to your farm. And we also hope that uh, producers who are on this call are willing to talk to their neighbors and fellow their colleagues in the uh, watershed and inform them about the projects and the programs that we can assist with. And hopefully we'll uh, get out there and assess all the different producers in the watershed for the update of the Little River 
uh, Muddy Brook Water Quality Improvement Plan so that we can keep this watershed eligible under the National Water Quality Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. All right. Everybody moved around. Eric McPhee from the Department of Public Health Drinking Water Division. So I'll talk, I'll, I'll just mention one thing. We're working on an exciting project. You know, we mentioned GIS earlier. Um, we're working on a project with the Connecticut Council of Soil and Water Conservation on a project funded by NRCS to develop a statewide GIS to assess the value of every pro uh, property in a, in a drinking water source area and its value to drinking water and, and looking at a number of factors uh, slope and parcel size and soil type and, and distance to the drinking water source and, and put a value on it in terms of its value or, or risk to, to a drinking water source. We had a, a great meeting with U.S. Forest Service a couple weeks ago to incorporate some of their data. And we're actually meeting with Deb Sarabian from NRCS State Soil Scientists next week to, to look specifically at uh, some of the existing data there is on soils in Connecticut and how that might feed into this, this GIS that's under development. So still so a work in progress and working with CLEAR at UConn and, and a lot of different partners to put together a good product. But hopefully um, by the end of the year, we have something great that we could share with everyone. Thank you, Eric, for that update. Let's see. And Maureen Nicholson doesn't have the ability to chat, but Maureen is the uh, first selectman for the town of Pomfret. I'm really glad that she signed in. Mar Maureen Marco from the Northeast District Department of Health. Maureen, can you unmute? Yeah, our, um, right now, um, most of us are, are tied up with other activities. So um, uh, due to COVID, so we're not really working on anything new. That's fair. I mean, thank you for working on COVID. We all want that to go I'll away. I'll just mention that as the coordinator for the last Green Valley Water Quality Monitoring Program, we're going to continue to focus as we can on monitoring for the cyanobacteria issues in Roseland Lake. Um, we had a very limited um, year last summer because of the uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic where we couldn't get people in boats because we couldn't get the physical separating distance necessary. But uh, we will be doing some monitoring in partnership with the Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative um, that's uh, coordinated by the US EPA um, Region 1 um, to collect some information on the types of cyanobacteria present in the algal blooms in the lake plus uh, Toxic, looking for toxins in those algal blooms to see if, you know, if it is it as bad as it is ugly, um, you know, looking for microcystin in particular. So um, I still don't have the data from last summer because the lab was closed. They couldn't analyze the samples, but we're going to continue to work on that until we can get back out and do some more substantial monitoring. So that would be um, our uh, Agency updates. Maura, it's time to move on to the next thing. Sure. I think we're almost done here, which is good because we're pretty much out of time. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm trying to share my screen here. Uh, so just the last things we have are next steps. So again, uh, just to mention um, those farm visits, uh, we're really looking forward to getting out and meeting folks and hearing about the issues that they have. Um, so in the, hopefully in the next six months, um, there is my contact information. You can also, also go to our ECCD website um, for other uh, contact information for Jean or Dan, but I'm happy um, as the project lead to, um, you know, talk with you and set something up. Um, and we also would like to um, potentially, well, we do want to meet again with this group um, and anyone who wants to join and possibly on a quarterly basis. So we were thinking about um, if you could save the date, May 5th, um, we can have a Cinco de Mayo party uh, <laughs> online. And um, that would start at 9 a.m. 
And unless folks have other ideas, that was kind of what Jean and I um, were thinking about. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Jean. No, I do not. Um, we'll, we'll just uh, we'll go forward with uh, what we have to do for this project and we'll keep people informed. Again, I put the link to the Facebook page in the chat. Um, I didn't have the forethought to get the link to the MailChimp account, but I will make sure that is in the meeting notes and we will share that with everybody who's been on this meeting today. Um, and you know, we've asked you to encourage other people to become informed about this project. If you see a Facebook post, post um, share it with people locally so that we can build our audience because uh, this is going to require um, everybody doing their part, you know, um, from small farms to um, people with uh, a few horses in their yard, everybody needs to uh, be part of the, the success in this watershed. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay, so um, just uh, looking at the chat, um, we did get um, Kira Jacobs um, put a link to um, that forestry learning um, webinar. So if you wanna take a look at copy copy that if you're interested in that you, you could do that now and um, does anyone else have any questions that they really wanted to ask um, and didn't get a chance to ask um, you can go ahead and do that now um, and otherwise we'll just give a couple we'll seconds put all the links in the uh, meeting notes we will put the links to the videos that unfortunately we couldn't show today more and I did practice that yesterday and we figured out how to make it work but I think when I got disconnected from the internet and then came back on I lost the settings that I had um, so we'll put the links to those videos as well and we'll be um, taking this recording and probably breaking it up into sections and sharing that through social media as well and uh, we hope that everybody is inspired and will continue to participate in this project as we go through it. Yes, and, and thank you again, everyone, the farmer panel for, for taking out the time. We're, we're really pleased with all of you that have shown up and uh, shown an interest. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Good day, everybody. Bye-bye.